In my previous entry, I demonstrated that Matthew and I have the same higher mind by comparing his philosophy, his philosophical writings, with my own. And of course, I compared things that I wrote before I could ever have seen Matthew's, naturally. And that was kind of highbrow. Uh, but today, we're going to go lowbrow. We're going to go from the sublime to the ridiculous. And I'm going to get a couple things accomplished at one time. I don't like to use the expression, kill two birds with one stone. It's too violent, so I try not to use it. What I'm going to do is to go through a blog entry that I published on February 1st of this year. I don't think too many people have seen it. And um, what this is, is a parody of Edgar Allan Poe's philosophy of composition. And I'll explain the uh, rationale behind it in a minute. But first, I think I have to go back over uh, the history of the philosophy of composition. I don't know quite how, how far back to go, but basically this was an identity theft scam that Poe pulled. And he pulled it on someone who was helpless to defend himself in the sense that Matthew could not go public to defend the poem. And Edgar Allan Poe possibly knew that. I don't know how he would have known that through the grapevine, but at any rate, he had a copy of this poem since early 1842. And you can find some evidence that, that Poe seems to have shown lines to people as though he was composing it, you know, and later in 1842 and so on. So that's where I would place it. Matthew shared this unpublished poem with him, which he had written in tribute to his late wife, Abby, uh, probably about the time it happened, December of 1841, which was a few months after Abby had passed on. So come 1845, Matthew is working for the New York Tribune, like a block away from where Poe is working for the Evening Mirror. And he is writing the reviews and essays in the Tribune, which are signed with his long accustomed signature, A Star, which historians have mistakenly attributed to Margaret Fuller. And he submits The Raven, Matthew does, to American Review, which is a brand new literary monthly. I'm sorry if any of this is a rehash for anybody, but I have to set the stage. So uh, he submits it under blank quarrels, being a reference to the poet Francis Quarles, who was a very austere, deeply devotional Christian poet whom Matthew would have loved, and more appropriately, I think, uh, more importantly, Abby would have loved. I think it was a pun. Blank quarrels meant Abby quarrels. And that was a name that he had given her because she was an excellent debater. <clears throat> That's my theory about it and my feeling. So blank quarrels actually meant Abby quarrels, which means that she not only loved Francis Quarles, but that she was unbeatable in an argument. So that was a, a tribute to her. The whole poem was a tribute to her. And it was about real grief that he'd been experiencing, a real faith crisis. If you see any madness in that poem, it was real madness. It wasn't made up as a horror poem by Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, Matthew really did get very close to the edge of insanity during that period, having lost Abby. So uh, Edgar Allan Poe, I think, felt it slipping away from him. He felt people questioning. He felt nervous that people would realize that he didn't actually have the ability to write a poem of that caliber. So he decided to create a phony backstory. So since this is identity theft, he decided to solidify his identity theft with fake ID cards, basically, is what it amounts to. So he wrote a philosophy of composition as though it was a philosophical essay about composition in general. It was not. It was an excuse to provide, as the supposed example, his history for having supposedly written The Raven. And what he did was he simply reverse engineered it. Very simple. He, he took it and, and pretended to explain how he had supposedly written this poem by breaking it down. And it's all BS. The whole thing is completely BS. And once you <clears throat> see it from that angle, it's obvious. It's just manifestly obvious. It's so obvious that I decided to write a parody of it last February. So the thing about Edgar Allan Poe is that he's extremely clever, he's shallow, any kind of philosophical depth coming out of this character is all a fake. Either he borrows it from somebody else, or he just bullshits. 
Okay, there's no real depth to this person, but he's extremely clever and intelligent. And uh, Matthew called him a mockingbird. And that's what he's like, is basically a mockingbird. So what he did was to go in here and try to pretend how he created the raven out of what I call pieces parts, or like Legos. You know, this element and this element and this element. Well, this is impossible because anybody with any intuitive discernment and depth themselves knows that the raven came out of real grief, that it was forged in the crucible of grief, as it were, that it was not created this way. So right off the bat, he's exposing himself as a phony. But shallow people are fooled by shallow explanations. Uh, you know, I don't mean to insult anybody, but this is the truth. If you don't have the depth to see that the raven was not built this way, then you're never going to get it. <laughs> okay, So uh, nonetheless, a parody is very much in order. Now, the thing about Edgar Allan Poe is that he was childish. I think, and I have a master's in counseling, so I have some authority to make an opinion on this anyway. I think that Edgar Allan Poe was a case of arrested development, arrested emotional development, which also means moral development. So he was arrested at a very primitive stage of morality, even though his mind was extremely, he was extremely bright. But he was like a little kid. His scams were like a little kid's scams, you know. So since Poe's scams were like a little kid's scams, I decided to run his philosophy of composition in the left-hand column. And the right-hand column is an essay by a fifth grader, a kid who thinks he knows everything about women and who writes an essay on how to get a girl. This is by Harold Bugle, which is to say Harry Bugle, Miss Engel's fifth grade class, Sunshine Elementary School. So what I've done is in the left-hand column will be one paragraph from uh, the Philosophy of Composition by Edgar Allan Poe, and in the right will be a paragraph from Harry Bugle about how to get a girl. And they're about on the same level because this fifth grader is, is really without conscience. He's a crass personality who's bright enough to write an essay, but he's basically an ignoramus and he's crass and he's sociopathic. I mean, he doesn't have any moral development. You know, well, Edgar Allan Poe was about on the same level. If you have ever seen Mr. Bean, the British comedian, the character Mr. Bean, Rowan Atkinson's character, he describes Mr. Bean as being like a nine-year-old boy is the way he describes that. And he is kind of the same way. He's very clever, but he really doesn't have a conscience, you know, um, and he has a mean streak. So, this, this kid that I've created, Harry Bugle, is very much the same way. Now, in the blog entry, I have given the whole philosophy of composition, but here it's a little too long, so I've truncated it a bit. And what I've done is to render in a different color the por portions that I'm going to read. Um, and to make it easy on myself, I have labeled each comparison. So I'll read Edgar Allan Poe's paragraph or the portion of it that I have uh, carved out here for this purpose. And then I'll read the corresponding paragraph in Harry Bugle's essay. And uh, we'll see if, if this comes across. So here comes Edgar Allan Poe, the Philosophy of Composition. This is his introduction. For my own part, I have neither sympathy with the repugnance alluded to, nor at any time the least difficulty in recalling to mind the progressive steps of any of my compositions, and since the interest of an analysis or reconstruction, such as I have considered a desideratum, is quite independent of any real or fancied interest in the thing analyzed, it will not be regarded as a breach of decorum on my part to show the modus operandi by which some of my own works was put together. I select, he just happens to select as an example, I select the raven as most generally known. It is my design to render it manifest that no one point in its composition is referable either to accident or intuition, that the work proceeded step by step to its completion with the precision and rigid consequence of a mathematical problem, which is to say Lego blocks. Now look at the big language. You know, when my uh, paper was recently rejected by a journal, I think they were looking for that kind of language. They weren't looking for street language, you know. 
Well, I don't give a shit about big language. <laughs> this is all just for show. All right, so Harry Bugle, he introduces his paper this way. And and just just remember that on the emotional, intuitive level, these, these two people are parallel. But this is with fifth grade language. Some of the guys still think that girls give you the cooties, but I don't believe it. I think girls are nice, and I talk to them and sit with them on the bus and at school. Because of this, I am an expert on women, and I don't mind telling you the way I get girls. So now, Edgar Allan Poe continues, let us dismiss as irrelevant to the poem per se, the circumstance, or say the necessity, which in the first place gave rise to the intention of composing a poem that should suit at once the popular and the critical taste. And Harry Bugle says, starting right out, forget about feelings, Feelings don't mean nothing when it comes to picking a girl. Most guys just want a girl who everybody else wanted, but you got her, and you know she will make you look important because she's so pretty. Edgar Allan Poe says, We commence, then, with this intention. And Harry says, So let's just start right there, without all the stupid romantic stuff. Poe, The initial consideration was that of extent, if any literary work is too long to be read at one sitting, we must be content to dispense with the immensely important effect derivable from unity of impression. For if two sittings be required, the affairs of the world interfere, and everything, like totality, is at once destroyed. There's more in that paragraph I'm not reading here. Harry says, the first thing to think about is size. You don't want a girl that's too fat or too skinny. That's even true for boobs. Some guys want really big boobs, but those can be unpractical. I like them just in the middle, but not really in the middle. That's a joke. Also, she shouldn't be too tall. Most guys like a girl to come up about to your chin. Don't worry, by the time you get to high school, it will mostly turn out like that. But if she's too short, you could get a crick in your neck from always bending your head down to talk to her, so you don't want that either. Poe. It appears evident, then, that there is a distinct limit as regards length to all works of literary art, the limit of a single sitting, and that, although in certain classes of prose compositions, such as Robinson Crusoe, demanding no unity, this limit may be advantageously overpassed, it can never properly be overpassed in a poem, Harry Bugle says. It just looks like nature has made it so girls ought to be a little shorter than guys, so you can talk down to them. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. It's not natural to be looking up to them. So you want a short girl, but not too short. Poe. Holding in view these considerations, as well as that degree of excitement which I deemed not above the popular, while not below the critical, taste, I reached at once what I conceived the proper length for my intended poem, a length of about 100 lines. It is, in fact, 108. And Harry says, with this rule, I made a mathematical formula. I figured out that when I'm grown up, I will be six feet tall, and I will need a wife who is five feet four inches. Do you believe it? I asked Miss Ingalls how tall she is, and she's five feet four inches. He worked it backwards, just like Poe is doing, in other words. Poe says, my next thought concerned the choice of an impression or effect to be conveyed. And here I may as well observe that throughout the construction, I kept steadily in view the design of rendering the work universally appreciable. I should be carried too far out of my immediate topic were I to demonstrate a point upon which I have repeatedly insisted, and which, with the poetical, stands not in the slightest need of demonstration. The point, I mean, that beauty is the sole legitimate province of the poem. And, Harry Bugle says, when you pick out a girl, the first thing to think about is what everybody else will think when they see you out in the public. You want them to say, boy, she's a real looker. He must be pretty sharp to have gotten her. The only really important thing to start right off is how pretty she is, and especially how pretty everybody else thinks she is. But when you're sitting at the lunch counter at the diner with your sandwich and your fries and checking your email, you want to be able to look over and see a really pretty face next to you checking her email. Now, you do want her to be able to talk good, too. Even if she's pretty, it doesn't get you hot if something stupid comes out of her mouth. So you want pretty, 
and you want smart enough that she doesn't say stupid things. You don't need a girl who sings songs or recites poetry. What gets you hot isn't poetry, it's just plain talking, but not stupid talking. Talking about the weather is okay, anything that guys and girls both like. Don't expect her to talk about cars and engines and football, but you don't want her talking about the makeup and chick flicks and other girl stuff neither. Just so she can talk about normal things and doesn't sound stupid. All this is easy to remember. You can boil it down to the fact that a real man wants his girl to be real pretty and at least smart enough not to sound dumb. Poe. Regarding, then, beauty as my province, my next question referred to the tone of its highest manifestation, and all experience has shown that this tone is one of sadness. Beauty of whatever kind in its supreme development invariably excites the sensitive soul to tears. Oh, he would know. Melancholy is thus the most legitimate of all the poetical tones. Harry says, So a guy has to pick a pretty girl, but there's lots of kinds of pretty. Which kind is the best kind? Some guys want a girl who's cheerful and bubbly all the time. But listen to me, it will make you crazy real quick. A sad girl isn't gabbing away at you all the time. Besides, every guy knows that a girl is prettiest when she's crying. Poe. The length, the province, and the tone being thus determined, I betook myself to ordinary induction with the view of obtaining some artistic piquancy which might serve me as a keynote in the construction of the poem, some pivot upon which the whole structure might turn. In carefully thinking over all the usual artistic effects, or more properly points, in the theatrical sense, I did not fail to perceive immediately that no one had been so universally employed as that of the refrain. Harry says, so now we've got the basics of what to look for, but what about the practical part? How do you actually find her and then catch her? The answer is you got to have a good line. The guy who has the best line gets the girl, because you got to get a conversation going to start with. It has to be something you can memorize and use over and over that will sound good even if you use it a hundred times. It has to be something that makes her say, wow, this guy is going to be interesting to talk to. I want to know more. And Poe says, these points being settled, I next bethought me of the nature of my refrain. Since its application was to be repeatedly varied, it was clear that the refrain itself must be brief for there would have been an insurmountable difficulty in frequent variations of application in any sentence of length. In proportion to the brevity of the sentence would, of course, be the facility of the variation. This led me at once to a single word as the best refrain. And Harry says, but you don't want something that goes on and on. The shorter your line is, the better. If you can figure out a line that's only one word or a couple of words, that's the best kind. Poe. The question now arose as to the character of the word. Having made up my mind to a refrain, the division of the poem into stanzas was, of course, a corollary, the refrain forming the close to each stanza. That such a close to have force must be son sonorous and susceptible of protracted emphasis admitted no doubt, and these considerations inevitably led me to the long O as the most sonorous vowel in connection with R as the most producible consonant. And Harry says, now you want to think about how the line sounds. It should sound sweet and interesting, but also kind of dangerous, because girls like that. They don't like nice guys. They like bad boys who sound sweet. So it should have some sweet sounds in it, but also some rough sounds. <clears throat> Poe says, the sound of the refrain being thus determined, it became necessary to select a word embodying this sound, and at the same time in the fullest possible, keeping with that melancholy which I had predetermined as the tone of the poem. In such a search, it would have been absolutely impossible to overlook the word, quote, nevermore. In fact, it was the very first which presented itself. And Harry says, so you want it short, and you want it to sound both sweet and rough or rude at the same time. I like the classic line, hey baby. You can't lose with hey baby. It's worked for a thousand guys. Now I got this from real life.
because when I was a teenager, I spent some time in Norfolk, Virginia. First time I was ever out on my own, Virginia Beach. And I went out on the town with some guys that I didn't know very well. They were going to pick up chicks. And I was intrigued. How in the world do they do this? Well, their method of picking up chicks was to drive up to a car full of girls at the light and yell out, hey, baby, and then take off because they were too scared to do anything. <laughs> that was their method. I, I thought, I don't think I'm learning very much here. Um, Poe continues, the next desideratum was a pretext for the continuous use of the one word, nevermore. In observing the difficulty which I at once found in inventing a sufficiently plausible reason for its continuous repetition, I did not fail to perceive that this difficulty arose solely from the pre-assumption that the word was to be so continuously or monotonously spoken by a human being. I did not fail to perceive, in short, that the difficulty lay in the reconciliation of this monotony with the exercise of reason on the part of the creature repeating the word. Here then immediately arose the idea of a non-reasoning creature capable of speech. And very naturally, a parrot, in the first instance, suggested itself, but was superseded forthwith by a raven, as equally capable of speech and infinitely more in keeping with the intended tones. So now Harry says, but if you're going to use the same line all the other guys use, you have to figure out a delivery that's different from all the other guys. It has to be believable, and it has to be interesting, and it has to be weird, and it has to be funny. I'm pretty good at gymnastics, so I figured out that if I do a headstand and yell out, hey, baby, it works every time. I can use it as many times as I want, and they always like it. At first, I thought about doing a cartwheel, but it's tricky talking at the same time you're turning, and you might run into something, so a headstand is better. Poe says, I had now gone so far as the conception of a raven, the bird of ill omen, monotonously repeating the one word, nevermore, at the conclusion of each stanza, in a poem of melancholy tone, and in length about 100 lines. Pieces, parts, Legos. Now, never losing sight of the object, supremeness, or perfection at all points, I asked myself, of all melancholy topics, what, according to the universal understanding of mankind, is the most melancholy? Death, was the obvious reply. And when, I said, is this most melancholy of topics most poetical? From what I have already explained at some length, the answer here also is obvious. When it most closely allies itself to beauty, the death then of a beautiful woman is unquestionably the most poetical topic in the world. And equally is it beyond doubt that the lips best suited for such topic are those of a bereaved lover. Harry says, Now when you've figured out your line and how you're going to deliver your line, you have to know what you're going to start talking about with her. You can't just give her your line and sit there dumb-like. So you have to have some topics ready. Remember, this is a girl and girls' minds work different. It's not like a guy where you can just up and say, How about them patriots? and already your buddy's just like that. I'll tell you the secret, though I don't really want to give it up. You talk about her. You ask her a question about herself. Almost anything will do. Does she like Miss Ingalls' class? Does she think the new vanilla icing on the cakes at lunch is as good as the chocolate? What's her favorite kind of weather? Compliments are good too, but unless you're experienced and can pull it off, I'd say go easy on that. But whatever you do, don't ask about anybody or any pets that died in her family. That will kill it. Poe says, I'm going to truncate this paragraph too. It's, it's kind of funny actually, but I won't, I won't, because uh, he goes on and on and on and on, but I won't bore you to death with it. I had now to combine the two ideas of a lover lamenting his deceased mistress and a raven continuously repeating the word nevermore. I had to combine these, bearing in mind my design of varying at every turn the application of the word repeated but the only intelligible mode of such combination is that of imagining the raven employing the word in answer to the queries of the lover. And here it was that I saw at once the opportunity afforded for the effect on which I had been depending, that is to say, the effect of the variation of application. This is all BS. This is all uh, reverse engineering BS. Harry says, now here's where it gets tricky. You've delivered your line. You're both talking, and you've got her talking about herself. 
a girl could go on talking about herself all day, but that's not what you want because you're not really interested in all that. What you want is to ask her out. So you have to move the conversation around to music or movies or food and then to the places where those things happen, like concerts and theaters and restaurants. But you have to be patient because if you're too obvious, she'll bolt like a scared rabbit. It just has to sound natural like. It should take about 10 minutes. Here, I'll give you an example. So Poe gives an example. He says, uh, here then the poem may be said to have its beginning at the end where all works of art should begin. For it was here at this point of my preconsiderations that I first put pen to paper in the composition of the stand. This is a barefaced line. Now, understand. And he quotes, prophet said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore. He has no interest in God whatsoever, he doesn't believe in God. Tell the soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, He's totally missing the real import of this. So here, Harry says, he's doing a headstand. He says, hey, baby, Nancy giggling. This is the example. That's funny. How did you learn to do that? Walking over to her with confidence. I picked it up in the gym and figured it out real quick. What do you like to do best in gym? I like volleyball. I'm the captain of my team in volleyball. Wow, that's great. I saw you in a game the other day. You looked really good. I saw you spike the ball. Nancy blushes. I saw you in cafeteria yesterday, too. What do you think about the new vanilla icing on the cake instead of the chocolate icing they used to have? I hate it. I really like chocolate. Me, too. Have you ever been to Pierre's Chocolate Shop? Poe continues. I composed this stanza at this point, first that by establishing the climax, I might the better vary and graduate as regards seriousness and importance the preceding queries of the lover. And secondly, that I might definitely settle the rhythm, the meter, and the length, and general arrangement of the stanza, as well as graduate the stanzas which were to proceed, so that none of them might surpass this in rhythmical effect. Had I been able, in the subsequent composition, to construct more vigorous stanzas, I should, without scruple, have purposely enfeebled them, so as not to interfere with the climactic effect. Matthew, this just came out of Matthew's mind. I think he just wrote the thing down all in one sitting. It was inspired poetry. He didn't have to think about any of this shit. So Harry, Harry Bugle says, you see, you have to keep in mind what you want the end to be, and then you work up to it. It's not just talking. You have to be thinking all the time about how you are going to get her to go out with you. Poe. And here I may as well say a few words of the versification. My first object, as usual, was originality. What a hoot. <laughs> The extent to which this has been neglected in versification is one of the most unaccountable things in the world. This is the big lie, the sociopath's big lie. Admitting that there is little possibility of variety in mere rhythm, it is still clear that the possible varieties of meter and stanza are absolutely infinite, and yet, for centuries, no man in verse has ever done or ever seemed to think of doing an original thing. The fact is, originality, unless in minds of very unusual force, is by no means a matter, as some suppose, of impulse or intuition. So he's saying it was not a poem that was inspired. In general, to be found, it must be elaborately sought. And although a positive merit of the high, highest class demands in its attainment less of innovation than negation. Now, in Waverly Magazine, signing as his star, the same that he was signing with in the New York Tribune when The Raven came out, he interjects himself into a discussion about whether Edgar Allan Poe plagiarized Thomas Chivers, whom he knew, to write The Raven. Uh, I think for the phrase nevermore and so on. Matthew suddenly shows up as the star, and at the end he says that he really is original. I won't belabor that point. It's pretty obvious. That's the same piece in which he says that Poe is a mockingbird. Now, uh, Harry says, I might as well talk about how to talk. You don't want to use too many big words because she'll catch on that you're trying to impress her, but you don't want to sound stupid. You don't want to sound too eager, but you also don't want to sound like you're trying to be too cool. Just talk normal, 
even though it's not really normal talk with a guy. But don't make the mistake of talking to her like a guy. If you have a sister, you can imagine you're talking with your sister, except that's not a girl you hate like your sister. The most important thing is to think up something different. It has to be something original that will impress her. That doesn't mean being down on stuff. You can be original without always being down on everything. Poe says, I'm only going to give the first sentence here. Of course, I pretend no originality in either the rhythm or meter of the raven. And Harry says, of course, nothing I'm saying is really original. I've just copied it from the smoothest operators I know and puts and some of it from movies and stuff. It's the way you put it together that's the original part. You take one line from one movie and another line from your big brother and another line from a TV show like that. It is original the way you mix it up. And if you do it just right, trust me, it will work. Poe says, the next point to be considered was the mode of bringing together the lover and the raven. And the first branch of this consideration was the locale. For this, the most natural suggestion might seem to be a forest or the fields, but it has always appeared to me that a close circumscription of space is absolutely necessary to the effect of insulated incident. It has the force of a frame to a picture. It has an indisputable moral power in keeping concentrated the attention and, of course, must not be confounded with mere unity of place. This is the part that Matthew lampooned in one of his coded messages. But uh, we will go on. Harry says, now I know what you're thinking. You want to get to the part where you suck face. But you have to be patient. You have to play the game and go through all the steps. You have to get her believing that you really, quote, care about her. Then she'll do it. Otherwise, you could get slapped or even kicked in the balls. Later on, when you've gotten what you wanted and you dump her, you'll be out of reach of that foot. So the best thing is to take her to some place where it's dark. Movie theaters are the best, especially when you're too young to drive. You can kind of sit far back and tell her it hurts your eyes to sit too close to the screen. She'll know you're lying, but by this time, if she likes you, she'll go with it. So this is how you get together. And Poe says... The locale being thus determined, I had now to introduce the bird, and the thought of introducing him through the window was inevitable. The idea of making the lover suppose in the first instance that the flapping of the wings of the bird against the shutter is a, quote, tapping at the door, originated in a wish to increase by prolonging the reader's curiosity and in a desire to admit the incidental effect arising from the lover's throwing open the door, finding all dark, and thence adopting the half fancy that it was the spirit of his mistress that knocked. And Harry Bugle says, the next thing is how to get her dress or blouse unbuttoned so you can do some heavy petting. But that depends on the way the darn thing is made. That's something you have to figure out before you get into the theater, but you can't let her catch you looking at it. There's buttons and zippers and catches and all of that and underwear and stuff. My big brother explained it all to me, but maybe you'd better ask your big brother about that. Poe says, I made the night tempestuous, first, to account for the raven seeking admission, and secondly, for the effect of contrast with the physical serenity within the chamber. And Harry says, you know the old saying, a bird in a hand is worth two in the bush. I say a bird in the bush is even better. But most guys don't get there. Remember that although the girl can't kick you in the balls at the theater, she sure as heck can kick you in the shins. My brother says it's not worth it. Poe says, I made the bird alight on the bust of Pallas, also for the effect of contrast between the marble and the plumage, it being understood that the bust was absolutely suggested by the bird, the bust of Pallas being chosen, first, as most in keeping with the scholarship of the lover, and secondly, for the sonorousness of the word palace itself. And Harry says, better to forget the bird in the bush and just go for the bust. <laughs>